Okay? That's a determinant hash function, right? So when the key is the same, no matter how many times you do the hash, it always gives you the same output. Okay? That's a determinant hash function. And in our case, in the context of our application, we have a family of hash functions. And you can make a random choice of which hash function to use. In this context, when you say determinant hash function, you are saying uh, the hash function size is 1. And, and there's, you know, there's only hash function, and this is also a determinant hash function satisfied by that requirement. If that's the case, you have no random choice whatsoever. There is no randomness involved in our construction. Everything is fixed. All right? Well, if that's what you're going to do, then there's the bad news, which is when the universe size is big enough, it doesn't have to be too big. As long as, 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 long as it's, it is at least this big, then you can find a set S from you know, this universe that all elements in this set are hashed to the same location. First of all, you know, without asking you to provide an argument to prove this, how many of you understand what this statement is saying? Okay, four. What about the remaining ones? What are you confused about? What does M stand for again? What is what? M in our equation. M is the number of hash buckets you have. The, uh, the size of the array, right? So this one times your hash function is what? Any hash function in this is a hash function from the universe. Okay. To uh, assess an array, right? A1, A2. Okay. Right? That's the setup. And the set of the S is a subset of the universe. That's the setup, right? That's the setup. So how many of you understand this understand this statement now? How many of you do not understand the statement? You don't know what's, what what this statement is saying. Okay, I would understand this now. Okay, all right. If you don't understand the statement, you know, in the meantime, you won't probably even understand what the question is asking. For example, I ask you to prove this, but if you don't understand even what the statement is, how can you possibly prove it? Uh, so make sure you understand what the statement is saying. Right? The statement, what the statement is saying, if if the size of the universe is is big enough, is bigger than this, then there exists a set from the universe of size n small n. You know, if this is the case. What, this, what the statement is saying is if you have this and set of h equals 1 and the hash function is a deterministic hash function, if both conditions are true, then there must be a set from the universe with this equal to n element equal to this equal to n, let's say s equal to x1, x2, until xn, n different elements, such that okay, using this hat function, they all map to the same element. Do you, do you understand what, what I'm saying? No matter how can this be possible? I mean, you are choosing, uh, last time we said, we are using capital N to denote the set of universe. You have this many choices to construct such an S. How can you possibly find an S such that all of them map to the same element? Like, almost impossible, right? But it actually happens when, uh, when, this, when this is true. Can anyone give me an argument? You have to learn how to prove your argument, right? Because that's what you need to do for me, term. I don't care what you do after my class, but since you are here, you have to do that midterm. So in the midterm, you have to do this, at least. So 
be able, you have to learn how to code. So how do you And you put it in M boxes. So uh, every box will have the setting of N, N over M. N over M. Setting okay. of N over M. So this equation, uh, maybe can I write on the board? Yeah, you can write on the board. pages you can distribute to different holes in this case. Pages. The last page, no matter how you do, will end up with another page. So that's a simple page in whole argument. Huh? Yeah. Of course you can of course put all n pages into the same hole and the other holes are all empty. That's fine. But that doesn't contradict with what I'm saying. That there is at least one hole has two pages. So how about connect with our uh, argument here? Okay, here the connection. Okay. So she kind of make it right, but she didn't make the final argument. So it's still not right if you, if you argue this way. Okay. The argument is as follows. I have M. No, I have you know, the, 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 the way to look at it is I have M array elements. I can view this as M holes. I have M holes, right? You follow me? Now imagine if I, if you look at the patient hole argument, the best case for the adversary is to do an even distribution of patients into holes. That's the best you can do to avoid having duplicates. Is that right? Similarly here, the best you can do from a hash function point of view is to do even distribution of elements to different uh, hash pockets in output. So each has one element, each has two elements, each has whatever elements, is that right? 
So let's say each has a minus one element. Now each has an element. element. Don't ask me how to do this. I just have this that uh, does this even distribution of elements to uh, to host. How many elements in total you have now at this point? Huh? Total number of elements you have. Now what happens if I add one more element? to my input space. What happens now? What happens now? You gotta have at least one bucket has an element. Let's say that's the that's A1. Without loss of it can be any one of them. It doesn't really matter which one you pick. Let's say I go with this. Now this guy has, so each of these has, you know, <coughs> imagine each of these dot is an element, so what I have so far is each of these has a minus one, but I have to push one more here, because I add one more, no matter how your hash function does the distribution, it goes to some hole, let's say it goes to hole number one, so this end up with an element, alright, I just choose this as my s, problem, argument proof, that's my s, that's my set, s. I found a set S, which is the subset of my universe, all mapped to the same hole. No matter how you construct the hash function. And this happens exactly when the universe is at least its base form. Proved. Okay? So that's the argument. So you have to use randomness. What, you know, the, the, the effort I spent there is to convince you if you try to use determinist hash function to solve our problem, you're hopeless. You're hopeless. Why? BYU coach can find 11 players that if you use a determinist hash function, BYU coach can find a, a way to uh, 11 players such that after going through your hash function, they all become one. So when you say block one, you will be confused. I have 11 guys to block. What do you mean by block one? It doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make sense? But you doing the continue the BYU Utah football game setup I, I mentioned last time. Okay, so that's kind of the argument. By the way, this particular lecture, you guys have to pay attention, right? This is, uh, this is like a simple exercise. The, 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 the argument and statement I'm going to pro, uh, uh, provide in the next 40-50 minutes will be much more uh, involved than this, much more trickier than this. Okay? So if you don't pay attention, you will get lost for sure. Okay? Alright, so, so that's this. So we need to use randomness to solve the problem. So we introduce something called universal hashing. So the idea is as follows. So the idea is that uh, so we're going to introduce a family of hash functions. Let's say I use a uh, small n to denote the double hash function I have. Is that okay? And any hi satisfy the following uh, requirement. Hi is a any Hi from this family is a determinist hash function, and Hi is a mapping from the universe to uh, uh, to a set M array. So every hash function in this family satisfies uh, the following two conditions. Any question on this? Yes. Could you repeat that last the second? Every every hash function map the universe to a set M array. Now, 
we make a random choice over which hash function to use for different elements. So for x, for y, I'm choosing different hash functions. But for the, for the same x, you always come to hash function. Once you made a choice for that particular element, you're going to stick with that choice. Because otherwise, you cannot even look up x if you use different random choices for the same x. That makes sense? So the setup is, for incoming element x, I choose a hash function out of this family, but I stick with my choice after that choice is made for that x. But for y, I will make a different choice for y. You follow me? Yes or no? So, universal hashing says the following. Of course, if, if, if this is the only requirement, there are millions of different ways of constructing this hash family, right? There are tons of different choices. Some are good, some are bad. How do I determine which is good, which is bad? So I'm going to define universal hashing. Universal hashing says, universal hashing says, okay, you can construct your hash family whatever way you want, but you have to satisfy, in addition to this requirement, you have to satisfy one more requirement. That one more requirement is, if x not equal to y, then my probability, of course, from the set s, that you have select s in a, a subset from the universe, right? This is a random choice, but made by your adversary, but once he or she made that choice, this set is fixed. That's what we said last time, right? So BYU coach can select 11 player out of the 100 player he or she has. That's a random choice, you don't know, but once he or she fix the 11 starting players, he or she cannot change that. But he or she, of course, now will not reveal those to you at the time of the hash function. That's what we said, right? That's not okay. If x is not equal to y, and both are from s, I need the universal require, universal hash require that the probability of the, the random choice is made from this. So that's the random choice. That hx equal to hy must less equal than 1 over m. The size of your array. The clear probability must be uh, less than just randomly choose a hole to go to. Go to. That's essentially what it says. Do all of you follow this argument? The random choice is made over this. That's how you calculate your probability. Okay? Yeah. I just I, I'm wondering if you could that math equation makes it look like you could possibly construct two hash functions that can perform better than a simple random choice. Um, it, that you just, I mean, doesn't doesn't solve the problem. Right, yeah, I, I suppose two, when you say two, that's essentially you are saying I'm equal to too small, I'm equal to too small. <coughs> but two might not be enough to give you this property. Right. Okay. So but that's what we're can, you can, can you construct a, a family of hash functions uh -huh. that for any two x and y that are not the same, uh, the probability of them ending up in the same bucket is less is less than the probability of just choosing randomly? But that's, that's no, I don't understand you. So what you're saying is, you put two elements, and you want to construct the hash family, and the clear probability is what? Less than? Less than 1 over m, which is the probability of just choosing randomly of your from your buckets. Uh, but 1 over m is exactly this. Right? So you're just stating what, what is 1 over m, which is? If you do this, universal hashing, I haven't shown you how to do this, okay. but what universal hashing requires is if you make a random choice over your hash function, the clear probability must be less than just randomly choose the market. That's essentially what it says. How do we do this? That's what I'm going to show you next. I'll, I'll, I'll say some more questions for you. Okay. Because okay. what you're saying is essentially this equation I show you here. You're just repeating this equation. Yeah, but I'm, I'm wondering how you can do better than, than like natural randomness, right? Like, what do you mean by natural random? Define natural random. 
so, so naturally random is, again, you have your n buckets, right? And natural, the, the probability that... I say what I'm saying. You say just randomly choose one which element to go. But I just argue to you if the size of the universe is bigger than this, even if you ask each of them to go a random place, I will find a subset where all n elements are not in the same part. That's what we just argued. Okay. So random, randomly choose an array uh, to go, it's not good enough. That's essentially what this argument is saying. Okay. Right? When the universe set is that big, you will have one subset. Even if you randomly choose the bucket, all elements in that bucket will end up in the same uh, in that set will end up in the same bucket. It sounds counterintuitive, but what the trick is you are selecting, you have n choose n different sets. And one of them will end up being hashed to the same market, even if each element of the universe is randomly distributed to a different market. That's the catch. Okay. Because you have many different sets. So I guess I'll, I'll look for the improvement that, that we made. Which I just made. Okay. Yeah. If you review that proof. Okay. Alright. So if H is universal, then for any set S of set M, and for any element in the universe, uh, if we construct the hash function at random according to a universal hash value, meaning you choose a random hash function out of that family, the expanded number of clearance between x and other elements in S is at most n over n. At least n over n. Okay? So how do we prove this argument? First of all, let's understand this argument. What, what it says. What it says is I have a set S, which is from the universe U, and any of them. Any one from this many choices I have, do you follow me? Any set from this many choices I have, I choose one of the set. That's my S. And, and then for any X from the universe U, note that X may be part of your S or may also not be part of your S. Does that make sense? Yes, no. Do you follow me? So X may belong to S but x may also not be of s because s is the subset of u so I choose my s first then I choose my x x could be part of s but x could be also offset that set s okay, that's what it says and if we, cons we choose the hash function from, from this then expanded number of clearance meaning if I count how many times hx is equal to hy or some y from s? I count how many times this happens. This is obviously in the random number because h is a random choice. So this value will change for different choices you made. Does that make sense? So it's a random number. So this is a random number. This is the random number. Does that make sense? This is a random number, right? Because it, the value of this change when you choose different h. Yes or no? Huh? This is a random number. First of all, how many of you know what's a random number? How many of you do know what, what is a random number? How many of you do not know? If you don't know, you better raise your hand because then I will explain. If you don't raise your hand, I assume you know. By the way, I expect you to know what a random number is if you are a CS master student. But if you don't know, fine, don't be shy, raise your hand. I will explain. If you don't raise your hand, I assume I really understand what a random number is, I will proceed. Okay, I really understand what a random number is. Okay, so this is a random number. And what this statement is saying is the expectation, let, let me use, let's say, uh, capital Y to denote this random number. What this statement is saying, the expectation of this random number Y is small n over capital M. I will need to prove this. Okay? So 
that's essentially what this statement is saying. How do we prove this? The question is how do we prove this? Does that make sense? Yes or no? Follow me? So the proof is as follows. Okay, I think some of you may still wonder, I see a lot of puzzle fits. You're probably just shy and not wanting not want to with you you can. But I do this is serious, right? I do expect you, not I the company potentially you're working for, uh, I think they will expect a CS master, master student to understand what a random number is. Right? So for example, why is a random number such that, for example, probability of y equal to, for example, is 1 equal to 5, and probability of y equal to 0 is 5. What is this? Can someone tell me? It's just a conflict. You flip a coin, Half probability you get hat, let's say hat equal to one, half probability you get tail, tail equal to zero. That's a random number. This is, a, this is the simplest random number you can expect. And what's the expected value of y in this case? Can someone tell me? For this random number, what's the expected value of this? Huh? 0.5, right? Why? Because 1 times 0 0.5 plus 0. I mean, random number is important. Why? Because our human entire civilization is built on randomness. At least to me, I hope that's the case. Right? I don't want to live in your, in your universe, everything is deterministic. Since I was born, it's determined I will do this, I will do this, I will make this much money, I will marry this person, I will do this. And that's boring. I don't want to be in that universe. I want to be in a un random, random universe. I hope you want to be in a random universe too, right? Otherwise, if everything is determined, determined ahead of time, why bother? Why you come to lecture? Why you do this? Everything is determined. Does that make sense? So we are in a universe of randomness. Right? So this is a simple example of random number. Of course, this is a much more complicated random number, which is how many times uh, uh, clearing happens. Could be one, could be two, could be... In the worst, you know, the, the max number of this is what? How many clear total clear? You know, in the worst case, uh, right? you 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 you, clue, you, clue, you have a clear with every single element of s. The smallest value is zero, right? So this is a number between zero and n, obviously. But it's 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 not a difference value because the choice h is a random choice. So the, for each h, there is a fixed value. For each h, there is a fixed value. Does that make sense? And there. Are this many choices you have, I'm asking you how many what's the expectation then? And that's the argument. How do we prove this? So the, uh, the, 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 the claim is the expectation is n over m, small n over capital M. How do we prove this? Here is the proof. Let me go over this and see whether we can follow along. Okay, So for each y from s, y not equal to x, based on the property of universal hashing, so this is given, right? Remember, we are given a universal hashing family. How do we construct one? We haven't talked about it yet. I will talk about that in the later slides. For now, assuming somebody gave us a universal hash family h that satisfies this property, this particular property. And this particular property is actually not easy to satisfy. But let's assume I somehow give you a construction that give you this. Somebody give you this. Okay? BMW car is hard to build, but somebody build it for you. You just drive the car. Don't ask how the car is built. I will explain later, of course, how the car is built. Okay, for now, let's assume you are given this. Now remember, this is a universal hash family. So no matter which one choice you make, that h, small h, uh, the probability for any y to have a clear is what? Is at, at most at 1 over n. Right? So the first claim is for any y from s, the probability of and 
this is what? This is just the property of universal hashing. Right? It's just the uh, property of universal hashing. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm, I'm just stating the fact. Right? Now, I will define, next, I will define a, this is a particular trait people use all the time called indicator variable. I call an indicator a random variable. This is a random variable. I just explained what a, what a random variable is. A random variable has multiple choices, each choice has value, and an associated probability. It's a probability distribution. Describing a probability distribution, that's what a random variable is. So I will define an indicated random variable that says CXY equal to 1. So basically, okay, let me change this to this. Equal to 1 if equal to 0 otherwise. It's a very simple uh, variable I define. If I complete, the value of this is 1, otherwise 0. Does that make sense? Now, why this is a random variable? Because this h is a random choice. So the value of cxy will be different depending on which particular h you choose out of that hash family capital H. That's why it is a random variable. The value of cxy is not fixed. It changes its value depending on the choice you make on the small h. You know what I mean? That's why it is a random variable. That make sense? Now, let's see x equal to the total number of clearance for x. The total number of clearance for x. x is what? Look at this statement. x is the element you choose from the universe. Total number of clearance represents how many clearance you have with element from set s. By this definition, what is cx? Cx is simply the summation of Cxy for y from x. Huh? Why? Why is the summation? Because if, if there, is a, there is a clear is 1, put the number of clear you have. Right? That's the trick of indicator variable. Of course, you want to get rid of the special case. If, if there's an element x in, in s that's x, then of course you don't count it. Okay? You don't count the self clear. Right? You, you get rid of self clear. Okay, so that's it, right? So, so far, follow me, right? So the expectation, so what we are trying to prove, now you know what we are trying to prove is the expectation of this must be this. That's what we are trying to prove, right? How do we prove this? Right? The statement claims the clearance is at most. Sorry, it's not equal. It's less than or equal to this. So we need to prove this. How do we prove this? Well, you just look at expectation. What is the expectation of CX? Expectation of CX is equal to expectation of summation of CXY from S and Y not equal to X. I'm just writing I'm just substituting the definition of CX into this equation. But linearity of random variables, which is with two random variables, X and Y, expectation of X plus Y equal to this. Of course, two independent. Two independent random variables. The two random variables are not in correlation with that. This is called linearity of random variables. In fact, you can generalize this to, if you, you can even have constant ax plus b, then this is simply equal to this, okay? By linearity of. Okay, so using that fact, this equal to summation of, because this is just a summation of, each cx y is a random variable, and they're independent from each other. So it's the summation of, I'm, I'm calculating the expectation over the summation of random variable, which is equal to the summation of the expectation of these random variables. Okay? 
So it'll become this. Bam, become this. Become this. And what's the expectation of CXY? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what universal hashing is supposed to give you. So this is, but using these two facts, we, we can claim that expectation of this must less equal than one over n. So this whole thing must be less equal than one over n. How many times? Yeah. N times. Because you sum over all the elements in S. And okay. So what so what what the, what the particular statement says is that universal hashing really, what what really universal hashing gives you is a even distribution of elements to uh, to the market. That's essentially what it, what what this statement is actually telling you. Yeah? So the next question is okay, universal hashing sounds really cool. Okay. Uh, how do you construct universal hashing? Like, now you test, you know, essentially what we're doing is I tell you, okay, there's so many nice features about BMW, and you test drive the car, you don't believe me, you test drive the car, now you say, oh, this is a really nice car. I prove all this nice property for you. But now suppose, of course, in, in human society, this doesn't happen all the time. Most people just, oh, nice car, nice features, I test drive, I like it, I drive away. Left happy afterwards. But for very few of them like ask, okay, how can you build such a nice car? I want to build one on my own. Okay, suppose you are in that small category, then that's essentially what I'm going to explain to you next. How do we construct such a universal hashing family? How do we construct this? The, the construction of this is not too big. Construction of this is not too big. Let me try to show this to you. But it's very, in my opinion, this is one of the most beautiful, elegant things. And it actually shows you a, a simple construction can have powerful features. Simple construction can have In my view, that's kind of how the universe works. The universe is constructed based on very simple principles. With a little bit of randomness, you get the universe. But the, the governing principle is so simple. Okay? So let's look at universal hashing. Now let me cons I need to use the entire space. So let me get rid of this. So, so suppose my construction, uh, my setup is as follows. The size of my universe, U, which is is two to the power U. That's okay, right? Two to the power U. I mean, you may wonder what, what if n is not the power of 2. Fine, uh, let's consider the matrix of of m by u matrix of 0 and 1 bits. m by u, you don't have to take notes, uh, this, this is not a slide. Next slide. My, my universal hashing family is simply the matrix of m by u. First of all, how many of you know what a matrix, matrix is? You all should know it, right? We have matrix. There are three fields on matrix. How can you not know it? You have three times to remember what matrix is. <laughs> right? Although I only like the first one. But. You watch the film Matrix, right? Do you? The idea is you take humans and you place them into cells of row and columns. That's matrix. Okay, that's matrix. Of course, here we don't take humans, we take bits 0 and 1. That's it. If I take humans, I will be in jail right away. So I take bits of 0 and 1 into this. I randomly fill up this matrix of m by u with bits and zero and one. So my random choice for each cell is either zero or one. That's what I'm doing. I'm not doing anything fancy. Really, really simple stuff. Okay? How many, what's the size of h when you do this? 
In other words, how many different metrics you have. Each metric is a hash function. You wonder how, wait a minute, how can a matrix be a hash function? I will show you in a minute. Actually, maybe I should that first. Since my universe is size of 2 to the power u, so my each element x from the universe, how many bits x must have? U bits. Uh, x must have u bits. So I can represent each x as a 1 by u vector of 0 and 1. Right? My x is just a 1, uh, one by u bit vector. Right? Any number can be represented like this. Huh? It's binary representation. Okay? That's, that's the essential way that. So the size u binary representation of x. Right? So I will take my x to here. Suppose my x is something like this. Oh, says u. It's one by u bit vector. I do a dot product between the two. Between this matrix and this x, what do I get? What's the output? What's the output here? Can someone it, is the output a matrix or a vector? Huh? Of course, you can argue vector is a special case of matrix. Okay, let's not consider vector as a matrix. Okay, is the output a matrix or a vector? Huh? Is output a vector or matrix? Let's answer this question. Vector or matrix? Vector, right? It must be a vector. So, m by u by u by one. The output is m by one. The output is m is a m by one vector. So it must be. And of course, I do the dot product. Of one thing I forgot is the whole thing uh, modular two, mod two. So all the each bit in the output is either zero or one because I'm modular by two. It can be only either zero or one. And this is of size m. So what's special about this? That's exactly the size. That's exactly the output range of my market. So what this output tells you, if you convert this to a, a decimal representation, it tells you this is a value between 1 and capital M. The capital M is to the power M. So this tells you which market this element goes. Right? Hence, this is my hash function. That's my hash function. This matrix is my hash function. Precisely my hash function. How do you do the dot product? You take the first row with this, the first one multiply this, add, the second one multiply this, this multiply this, add up together, that gives you this, modular 2. If you don't know what dot product is, you should go back and review what dot product is. Okay. Make sense? So far, so good. Similarly, you take the second row, which is set u, first one multiply with, with the first one, add with the second one, multiply the second one, third one, multiply the third one, add up together, modulo 2, that gives you this value. You do this m times, that give you a set m output. So that's my matrix. That's my matrix, and that's my hash function. So each matrix defines a hash function by now. You should do like this, right? Is that right? How many hash functions I have? Um, how many hash functions I have? Two uh, to the power of m times u. Excellent. The total number of hash functions I have is two to the power u times m. Why? Can you argue why? Because each uh, cell in the matrix can have zero. And Excellent. And there are m times two cells. There are m by u cells in this matrix, and each each cell has a choice of two, which is zero or one. And each choice is independent of each other. So total number of choice I have, which is total number of matrix I have with, is simply this. And that's exactly the size of my hash family. That's good. Okay. 
now we know what the hash family is, and we, well, we know we know each what each hash function is. So next next time Google asks you, oh, show me a hash function. So just use a u by m matrix filling with random zero or one. You will impress him on her already. And you can ask him on her, what's the property of this matrix family? Which I'll call you back and you got an offer. Yeah. Of course, it's going to be not easy. People in Google assume they're okay. Uh, okay, so that's what we have. So what's the property of this? You may want to find, you know, it sounds interesting. You do this vector construction. It's, you know, it's, it's really beautiful that the matrix can be used as a hash function, which I didn't realize. Now you know matrix can be a hash function. So that matrix movie is not made of nothing. I mean, that matrix can do actually something for you. <laughs> even with just zero and one bit, I imagine you put a human in each cell. You can do even powerful things. All right, uh, what's the property of this, uh, uh, this hash family? Can someone make a guess? We're doing this in the context of universal hashing, right? So, of course, the property is <laughs> clear and probability must be less than. If I do this, my, this must give me probability of, if I choose this, the clear must be what? It must have this property. Otherwise, why I'm spending this much effort on this? Right? It must have this property. But why? Why they have this property? Here is the argument. So this, right now you should understand what's going on here, right? This is the specific H. This is one X. In this case, U equal to 4, M equal to 3. So I'm mapping a, a 16 elements universe to uh, 8 hash pockets. That's essentially what I'm doing. Huh? Now, one thing to note is that universal hash family doesn't equal to a random hash function. If you look at this construction, if I choose my x to be 0, meaning I use 0 for all, all the b's here, all the ub's here, what, what do you end up with? No matter what this h is, how you construct your matrix, like Tanya has suggested, you have that many choices, I don't care. If I choose all zero here, this will be all zero. Right? Because it's whatever it is, this multiply zero, this multiply zero, this multiply zero, this multiply zero, zero, add up together, small zero two, it's gonna be zero. Similarly, this will be zero, this all of this will be zero. So we have this property, h zero equal to zero, no matter which h you choose, no matter what random choice you make. So picking a random function from this hash family does not map each key to a random place. If it does, if picking a random function from h does map each key to a random place, proof is that, right? Then the expectation of the clear must be 1 over m, because each key goes to a random place. It's what must, the clear probability must be 1 over m. That's a simple proof, but it does not. Right? That's why I'm arguing this, right? No matter if you don't have this part, if each key doesn't map to a random place, how can clear probability be still 1 over n? Sounds like impossible. But that's the beautiful part of this. It, it still does. Even though we don't have this property, the clear probability is still 1 over n. Why is that? Okay, the proof is a little bit tricky, okay? I hope all of you can follow me. Okay, the proof is that follows. If you look at what this hash function is doing, what does it do? It's adding up columns of this matrix, right? With this statement. We can think of adding some of the columns of H. <coughs> where the one bit in X indicates which column to add. What does it mean? This must have this add up together to this. The one bit indicate I'm adding in this particular example, I'm adding the first and third column of each row. Right? Because if zero is irrelevant, because I'm doing addition. And 
zero multiply whatever give you zero and you add up together have no effect. So essentially what you're doing is you are using this x as the indicator at which column from each row to add up. You are adding up. To of course modulo 2 in the end to get the final output here. Another observation, of course, goes without saying is each cell in the output is either 0 or 1 because you are modulo 2. Can we guess? Now, what's the effect if I flip this bit from 1 to 0? What happens? If you flip a bit from 1 to 0, you will flip this from 1 to 0. You know, if the problem is not 0, of course. If it's 0, flipping this has no effect. But multiply to 0. But if it is not 0, if you flip this from 1 to 0, it's kind of like you're adding one less, you're adding one less to the total sum, and the result this will be flipped. From one to zero, because you are modular two. Each one, each additional one will flip the output. Three. Three become one, four become zero, five become one, six become zero, so on so forth. So one more value to the sum after modular two will basically lead to a flip of the output bit. Because we're modular two, we call it modular two. Let me guess. See some color bits, okay? One more value to the sum lead to the flip in the output because you are modular two. Okay, that's good. That's a key, that's a key observation. Okay, keep in mind that's a key observation you have. So okay, what we're doing is we're using this x to add up some of h to determine. But you have to remember we are determining not the entire output. We're determining only a single bit of the output. And you are doing this for m rows, leading to m different bits. But for each bit in the output, this x basically indicates which column to add. That we can? That's essentially what's going on. Now, when, when does clearing happen? Clearing happens when I have two x and y, a pair of x and y, they're, they're different. If x equal to x, they're bound to have clearing. Because we're talking about determining the hash function. If you have x and x and they have they map to different values, uh, then you, you have, you're in trouble. It's like I leave my key on my door, right next to my uh, on the on the table, right, right next to my door every day. I, I, I enter my house. The second morning, the key is no longer there. Don't tell me you will not be puzzled if you are the only guy in the house. I will be upset. The second I will have trouble sleeping. To me. No, it's weird, right? Uh, so we're talking about determine each hash function is determined hash function. Right? So it's two different x and y. And since x not equal to y, what can you claim about them? Well, they can be really, really different. But the best, well, the worst case for you, in terms of avoiding clearing, intuitively, is they're if they're very, very different. Versus they are very very similar, which has a higher chance of clear the latter. So if I can show even for the very similar ones, their clear probability is small. Then for the very different ones, they must be having no clear, right? So in the extreme case, they are all the same except one bit. That's as similar as you can go because going beyond that, you get identical values. So they are the same except one bit. This is my x, this is my y, and y is going to be. I'm going to just change this bit. Then the remaining ones is identical. They only differ here. Okay? Then we can. Now, without loss of generality, okay, I should use the value. System with my proof. Let's say this they differ in the next bit. 
where x has a zero, y since it's different, y must be one. I mean, the earlier case is symmetric to this. I'm just, you know, uh, to be consistent with my slides. So far, everybody follow me? Now, what happens when you do this? What happens when you do this? Using the earlier argument I just showed you, you are potentially just flipping the beat of the output. And you want to look, you want to check how often this happens. When, you know, for those cases where flipping this value does not lead to the flip of the output beat, what do you have? You must have a clear, because all the other bits are the same. But when it does, the flip there does lead to a flip of the output, you do not have clear. You just count how many times you flipping this lead to a flip of the output versus how many times flipping this doesn't lead to a flip of the output. You versus you calculate the ratio, that's exactly the clear problem probability of this hash map, of this hash family. Huh? That make sense? So that's the equation. Now next I'm gonna show you exactly how to do this counting. How to do this counting. So imagine we choose since we are making a random choice of this, right? And this is one, two, three, four, the fourth row here. First row determine the fourth row of this matrix, right? Because they, no matter which row you are using, they only care, the, the effect of these two values only affect the fourth column of this matrix. That's how dot product works. So I'm gonna fix all my matrix, like Tanya suggested, it's just a random choice of 0 and 1. So I make my random choice for all the other places, including the fifth column. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so forth. But I'm leaving out the fourth column. I made my random choice already for all the other places, but for the fourth column, which is M of them, M rows, I don't make my choice yet. I haven't made my choice yet. Is that clear? Is that clear? So you are doing this. You are essentially doing this. You are doing, you are making this random choice at this moment. You are almost done, but you are not done yet. You are making this random choice. Does that make sense? Do all of you follow me? All of you follow me. You're making this random choice, except you, know, you haven't made your random choice for the fourth column. So, as a result, your hash function is not completed yet. Your hash function is not completed yet. So that's what it says. Now, the second statement says over the remaining choices uh, of s columns, h actually is fixed. Meaning, if you don't Count this one, does this multiply everything else except the S row of X? They are fixed. This multiply this, this multiply this, this multiply this, and this multiply this. You sum up together except this is fixed. Does that make sense? In addition to that, because S row of X is zero. No matter what choice you have here, it's still fixed because you're adding an additional zero. Does that make sense? So at this point, no matter what you're going to choose, you can make whatever choice you want. The output of x is already fixed. No matter, even though I haven't made my choice yet, each x is already fixed because this is zero. The contribution to the first bit is zero, the contribution to the second bit is zero, the contribution to the third bit is zero, so of course. Because I'm just adding an additional zero. No matter this is one or zero, I'm just adding another zero to that first bit. No matter what this is one or zero, I'm adding just another zero to this, so on so forth. Do all of you follow me? So each x is fixed. Yes? Now let's look at h1. 
Uh, what, what about H1? Here is the tricky part. Okay? What about H1? You know, if, if, if H1 is already fixed too, then we're doomed. They, 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 they have clean all the time. But it is not. That's the that's thing, right? How many choices do I have for this column? Total choice. <coughs> Using Tanya's argument. You have this many choices. You have this many choices, right? Which is just M, which is capital M. And because this bit of Y is 1, and you are doing modular 2 operation, you're doing modular 2 operation, out of this many choices, there's only one choice going to lead to the identical H X of, which is that choice. Zero all the way down. Zero all the way down, exactly. Why that's the only case lead to the same? First of all, that is easy to say if it's all zero, it leads to the same output as your HX because essentially you are adding an additional zero to every bit of the remaining one. The remaining one are the same. They, they multiply add up together. So if it's all zero, multiply zero multiply y is zero, so you add zero to the first one, you add zero to the second one, so, on, so, on. so it must be the same as that HX. All of you follow me? So that's the only choice leads to the same output. But why, if I change, for example, the second one to one, it leads to a different output? Well, if you do that, if the second one is a one, then for the second row, which determines the second bit of the output, you are adding an additional one to that bit. But this argument that will flip that particular. Now, any y in any position will lead to a flip of the corresponding bit, which leads to a different location in the hash part. And there's only one choice out of these two n choices that lead to the same output, which is, so the clear is what? The clear probability is exactly this. We just n of proof, OK? n of proof, or not. Okay, so that's the move. Not easy to understand, but once you understand it, it's like simple. Okay? It's like 1 plus 1 equals 2. But if you don't understand it, it's like really hard. But once you understand it, it's really, really simple. So that's the argument. So now we know how to construct a universal hash family, right? Simply get a matrix of size u by n and filling that with random bits zero and one, you get that nice property that for any x and y, the clear probability is less equal than 1 over n, capital N. By just doing this. So next time you watch uh, the movie Matrix, the bad guys, they don't even have to put humans there. You just put 0 or 1 bits there, they can do something already. That's really cool. Right? At least holding the element hash to that part. Right? And this is my universe U, and my set S, select from this, then for my S, for every element, uh, they go through this, this process, and you use this to determine where it goes. Right? <coughs> Suppose XI goes here, XJ goes here, X1 is here, X2 is here. That's kind of the picture, right? You want to have an even distribution as even as possible. But if your hash function is bad, you may end up with something like this. The one particular array element that's really skewed. Now when this happens, what's so bad about this? Well, if you look up any element here, for example, if you look up this x, and up here, you have to do a linear scan of this, which is really expensive, right? Does that make sense? So the question is, can I do look up Can I do this? What essentially it says is, I want to 
make sure I don't have long list. Each list is of size constant. May, may not be one, but it must be a constant, one or two or three. So that no matter where I go, I just scan the cost is just constant. That's essentially what I'm saying here, right? Does that make sense? Yes? 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 Obviously, this is, this is dependent on this value, right? If my m, in the extreme case, if m equal to 1, you are hopeless. Well, no matter how smart you can design your hash function, you can be as smart as whoever you want to be, all of them end up in the same bucket, then your lookup cost is what? Is at least this. All n elements end up in the same bucket. Right? So, how do we uh, universal hashing says nothing about the size of your hash of right? Only says universal hash only says right? If m equal one, what this says is clear probability less than one. Oh, that's good to know. So I'm going to rest tomorrow. Yes, I mean, it's a fact. There's no dispute about that, but, but, but what's, what's so special about it? That make sense? So universal hashing only tells you the clear probability. It doesn't tell you what's the cost of lookup. Do you follow me? For example, m equal to 1. Your lookup cost is still linear. And I tell you the clear probability is less than or equal to 1. Oh, fantastic. Of course, a clear probability cannot be greater than one, right? We're talking about probability here. Oh, so I'm going to rest tomorrow with the probability. Oh, if, I, if anyone tell you like that, <laughs> you know, you don't want to be a friend of that person, right? Well, who, who knows what else, what, what other crazy thing he or she can do? You have to at least make sense. Probability cannot be greater than one, right? So you are saying really nothing, okay? All right. Uh, so even for universal hashing, we are not still not clear how do we make sure the lookup cost is constant. Well, there's a simple construction to make sure the lookup cost is constant for universal hashing. How do you do that? Well, I simply said m equal to one over n. Oh, sorry m equal to n squared. I said m equal to n squared, then I claim if it's universal hashing with clear probability less than or equal to 1 over m, and my m, my number of number of holes in my output is n squared, I guarantee you lookup cost constant. In other words, the least of each list must be a constant. Cannot be really long. How do we prove this? Do you follow my argument as well? And why n squared? Why not n to the power of 1.5? Why not n cubed? Why not n to the power of 4? One thing that's clear though, anything bigger than n squared, of course, will work as well. You're, you're, you're adding more holes. The least can only be shorter if you do that. Meaning the lookup cost can only be smaller if you do that. But there's, a, there's the overhead, right? You have to hold that many holes. It's not like these holes are free. You have to hold them somehow. It costs you memories. So why n squared? Why can you go smaller than n squared? Why not n to the power of 1.5? Why not n to the power of 1.8789? Why must it be n squared? Okay. There is a rhythm for it. Uh, let's try to prove that. So the claim is, if H is universal and M, capital M is n squared, then my, it's not clear in probability, but there's no clear at all for any two elements in S is at least half. Meaning, if, so what I'm claiming is this and H is universal. In other words,
So given this two, I'm going to claim that the probability of okay, probability of this is a clear, right? I need two elements in S, but I want no clear, right? By the construction of universal hashing, we are using universal hashing, so this must be, of course, if I'm not, I must be precise, I'm making my random choice here. So far, so good. So the probability and, and these two are independent, the two events are independent. So the probability of there exists a, a clear event, if you do it once, there exists a clear probability of one right now. How many times you're doing this? You're doing exactly this many times. So the, there is, exists a clear somewhere is must be less equal than this. Right? It's like you flip the coin once, you got a hat with this many properties. You flip the coin this many times, there is at least one hat. What's the property that you must go at? Right? Getting the hat probably multiple how many times you're doing this. This is 
And if, if m is n squared, this is what? n choose 2 equal to? And this is less than i. So the probability for there exists a clear half. So no probability, no clear must be greater than half. Because the probability space is, there exists at least one clear, or there's no clear at all. Add up must be equal to one. If there's at least one clear, the probability of that is less than half, then no clear must be greater than half. Because they add up to one. No, because they add up to one. But n squared sounds like, uh, I'm not sure. Because what you're telling me is, okay, if my n is a million, in order to do a, a perfect lookup, constant lookup, oh, you're telling me to use this many space for just a million uh, elements. Seems like a little bit excessive, right? Seems like a little bit excessive. Can you do better? There is actually an open space solution. Meaning you can do this, and still you have roughly just one element per, per market. That's actually the best you can do if you think about it. Right? Because the best is each one goes to a different market. How do you do this? So, uh, this is. You may wonder, OK, wait a minute, this is trivial, right? I mean, I have n elements. I just make sure the first element goes to the first. But keep in mind, at the time of designing your hash function, you don't know what that set S looks like. You have to choose your hash function independent of the other guy choosing that set S. It's like a game. You make your move, he or she makes his or her move independent of each other. Once you make a move, you cannot change. Meaning you can change your hash function, he or she cannot change what sets an element he or she has to choose from the universe. Then you will be both of them submit to a judge and check what the clearance is. It's not like he or she makes the choice of S of an element tell and send those an element to you, then you say, oh, easy, first one goes to first, that's my hash one. No, it's not like that. You don't know what those an elements are. That's that's the tricky part, you have to understand, right? So this is actually extremely hard to do. It's not easy to do, and this is called perfect hashing. Uh, I'm gonna skip this part, because to understand the proof is fairly involved, so I'm gonna skip this. And this is a static case. Static case means that you adversely choose an element, and he or she then make no change afterwards. What if he or she can make change afterwards? Can you still do this? Uh, that's what we call the dynamic case, and people have done something called cuckoo hashing for that. Uh, I'm gonna uh, skip this. Uh, if you're interested, you can read the paper. Uh, I have to stop here. Uh, next lecture, I'm going to continue. On Thursday, I'm going to continue the discussion with something called K universal hashing. It's an even more powerful construction than universal hashing. And with that discussion, by the end of that discussion, you should be an expert on hashing. Probably there's maybe one or two guys from Google knows better than you than hashing. Maybe one or two is exactly. Maybe less than 100 people in Google knows better than hashing by that time. If you fully understand what I'm saying, of course, maybe you don't fully understand what I'm saying, then that's a different part. If you fully understand what I'm saying and also all the proof I gave you, then you should be an expert on hashing method uh, after Thursday lecture. Okay? All right, see you on Thursday.